Well, welcome everybody to FLOW uh, 2021 Stilling Photography Festival. Huge welcome to Frances Scott, who's joining us from Glasgow, and she's going to talk to us tonight about her project, A9, A Lifelong Journey. Uh, just briefly how we came to uh, work with Francis. Um, it's a connection that's come about through uh, the Highlands and Islands Fine Art Photography Festival, Flow Photo Fest. Uh, the director there, Matt Sillers, and I have been talking for a couple of years about how we might work together and collaborate. And when we met earlier this year, we talked about what connects us as well as photography. And Matt had the inspirational idea that the A9 connects us and are you just the person who should come to the festival and work with us this year. So we've had the benefit of having Francis exhibit both in Stirling at the Tollbooth and at Hoko in Inverness. Uh, simultaneously throughout August, her A9 uh, monograph has been exhibited in both places. And so we're delighted to have the added benefit of Francis talk to us tonight and share a bit about her journey down the A9 and how that project came to be. So I would like to welcome you, Francis, to Flow 2021, and we look forward to your talk this evening. Um, I think that's it from me. So over to, to Francis. Enjoy, everyone. Thanks very much, both of you, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'll just get my presentation up. Okay, so, um, as Janie said, I'm going to be telling you about my A9 project tonight. Um, uh, first of all, I'll tell you about myself and then a bit about um, sort of the ideas that sparked the project, why I have this connection with the road um, and also its development from initially being a submission towards my final year at art school to then um, taking form in print and most recently in an exhibition setting. Um, and yeah, first of all, a bit about me is um, I'm from Orkney, uh, currently based in Glasgow, where I work at the art school part time as a photography technician. Um, and I think it's time for the next slide. Yeah, so uh, I studied, sorry, I studied communication design at Glasgow School of Art, specialising in photography, and I graduated seven years ago. So this project was part of my, my final year submission. Um, so yeah, one of the sort of main things I make work about uh, is journeys through a landscape. Um, I'm interested in the way that we store sort of memories or feelings in the land and by traveling through them, we're allowed to re-engage with these memories or we can sort of store almost a version of ourselves in different places and re-engage with them through walking or driving through those places. Um, so yeah, the I'm also wanting to discuss sort of any associations or nostalgic significance that the road might hold for yourselves. Um, when I was very young, my parents separated. Um, initially started life in Orkney, but my mum and I moved down to Hoyk in the borders. And uh, this meant that each holiday, four times a year, she would parcel me up into the back of her car and she would drive north to Wick to see her parents, my grandparents, and my dad up in Orkney. Um, I was an only child, so I had no siblings to keep me company. Um, my mum was quite a cautious driver, so she asked me to keep quiet while she was driving with me. And uh, so really, I just had the window to keep me company. The A9 is Scotland's longest road, running 269 miles from the lowlands to the country's north coast. Um, I've marked it here, kind of beginning in, around Falkirk in the south and ending in Scrabster in the north. It's taken different routes throughout history. It used to end at John O'Groats. Um, it used to wiggle about inland, sort of to Bewley before being updated and more recently um, cutting across in a series of bridges. While doing research for another project, I came across a quote by Rosemary Sullivan that said, the landscape of childhood provides the foundation layer of our psyche. This really struck with me. Um, so I became interested in the way that these initial landscapes became part of my fundamental understanding of Scotland and of my family. And it kind of split me into this binary, you know, two parents, one in the north and one in the south. Um, this kind of island versus city, childhood, childhood versus adulthood. And when leaving home aged nine, it was really satisfying having moved back to Orkney and heading to the cities. 
uh, to have this sort of physical distance between myself and my home, all these markers of, of north and south. Um, I've gathered here a list of, of signifiers that as a child were really important to me. So you can imagine when you're that age, um, time is kind of endless. You have no idea when this journey is going to end. So I don't know how many of you have travelled up and down the A9, but for me, one of the one of the rituals was at the start of the journey, my mum would give me two 20p's, which I had to use as the toll money to get across the Port Road Bridge. When we got there, I would pass this to her. Um, and I was always really taken by the um, the, the sort of lorry escape beds at Berrydale and Dunbeath, thinking, are we going to end up in those? What are they for? And things like the um, wire encased uh, slopes at Slocht always really captured my imagination. Yeah, so first of all, some of the research that led into the project, um, of course, looked at A1, the Great North Road by Paul Graham. This was one of the works which kind of made me really wistful to actually work in colour. I mean, the way that he's captured the that sort of very familiar wet British tarmac. Um, but his work was more kind of about the people whose, whose lives were along this road, whereas my journey is much more solitary. It's, it's me traveling through a landscape, kind of picking what I want from it. Another body of work, which was really significant um, and kind of affecting my imagination towards the project was Westward the Course of Empire by Mark Rudell. Um, this is a body of work which he's been working on since 1994. And it's about the, um, the building of the railroads across America, um, kind of, the, the sort of hubris of man to sculpt the land for their needs and wants, you know, um, aside from what, what nature wants. And it's these sort of rickety bridges across ravines or these blasted rock faces going into a tunnel that really uh, connected with what I wanted to capture from the A9 project. Um, and in this case, uh, kind of technologies overtook the progression of the railway meaning that a lot of these were defunct by the time they could have been used. So there's a kind of ghostliness to them that I really enjoyed. And another project which um, maybe I connected with in relation to the A9 on a more aesthetic rather than conceptual aspect was um, the images of Burnt and Hilla Becker, these sort of ghostly structures dotting the landscape. Something that I would really recommend if any of you have sort of childhood memories of the A9 or family connections with heading up north uh, is to watch the A9 Highland Highway. So um, this showed the A9 pretty much as we know it today, um, as it, it was reconstructed in the 70s and 80s. So this kind of really linked to hearing my parents talk about the old road from their childhoods saying, or when I was young, we didn't used to get to go across this bridge. We had to go miles inland to Bewley, that kind of thing. And also hearing about my dad's dad spending two full days trying to travel from Edinburgh to Scrabster when traveling to Orkney. So this documentary kind of links to the road my family experienced before me. It also shows the vast scale of the changes to the landscape, that idea of humans sculpting nature to their will, Things like diverting the Tay, building the mountain pass at Slocht, um, and the you know the series of bridges north of Inverness. It's grand. It's you know huge scale, monumental. I've always been interested in geography and man's relationship with the land. Um, and a quote that I I really liked from the sort of narrator of the documentary was, "At its best, the art of landscaping is a kind of sculpture." that is both panoramic and monumental. Um, so these kind of landscapes were built to be seen from a moving vehicle, not stopping one by one. And sort of for me, going under bridges, um, stopping at the roadsides really kind of brought the excitement of the road alive for me. Uh, and this bit top right is something that having driven over it, you know, a hundred times and never realizing, but at Slock, they actually had to build a bridge over a bridge, over a railway. And so this documentary, it kind of uh, 
brought an excitement to traveling the road that I knew was there, but it sort of pinpointed exactly why. And um, so I would recommend if, if like me, you have an interest in this, go and watch this in your spare time. So a bit about the time scale of the project, how it came about. So when I was in fourth year art school, it was the last of a series of projects that had all been about journeys. And I'd always had this one at the back of my mind, um, but I never had the means to do it. Um, I didn't have a car, I couldn't afford to hire one. But in the April of that year, um, my granddad in Wick died and I got the use of his car. So in the run up to that, bearing in mind that the deadline would have been kind of the end of May, quite a short period of time to make a new body of work, um, I had the opportunity to travel up north a couple of times. His funeral was in Inverness and um, I went up on the train and luckily for me the railway runs really close to the road so I just sat glued to the window and you know noted down things that I would like to photograph, things of interest along the route. I then travelled back down to Glasgow again and a third time back up on the bus. Um, so things like when you're driving you can't be looking out the window like that all the time. So I was noting like the nearest lay-by to such and such. So I, I kind of built a, a framework of what I wanted to gather. And then on the journey itself, I allowed other things to come up naturally. Um, the, it took three days from start to finish. I had a limited time period. So the first day I set off from Wick using my granny's house as a base. And I covered the old A9 first. So it used to, as I said, end in John O'Groats. So I covered that first triangle of Caithness across to Scrabster, which for me was a really key point on the road. It was is it my departure or arrival point for getting to Orkney. Then the next day I had trans uh, sorry, not transport, uh, accommodation booked in Strathtay and I had to get down there, but unfortunately my camera steamed up. So that second day was a really difficult one in terms of making images. It was mostly sort of driving and cursing <laughs> that it wasn't working. So the third day I had to double back up to Inverness and capture what I'd missed the day before. But because of this, it created really interesting experiences, which I'll cover in the next slide. So writing for me is really important as an accompaniment to my images. And in this series, I intersperse small paragraphs of written reflections between my images. Um, I think at that point in time, I would have found it too difficult to pinpoint in writing exactly what the A9 holds for me. So it was better to focus on this one particular set of experiences, which was the very first time that I had driven the whole road alone. The writing kind of hovers over the surface of a deeper sense of nostalgia associated with the road. Um, because I was a relatively young woman putting myself outside of the normal rules of traveling, you know, I wasn't going to A to B, I was stopping, I was wandering around. I had a number of strange encounters over the course of the journey, including being stopped by the police and confronted by a gamekeeper. And both times my camera got me out of the sort of awkward situation. Um, and without including it in writing, this perspective would be lost. I like the balance of including writing with photography because it relieves a pressure on my image making. If I haven't been able to capture something because it was too fleeting or it just wasn't aesthetically right, I've covered it in this other medium. And these written interludes kind of draw the viewer in uh, to share this solitary journey with me. So these bits of writing, I then adapted into a, a booklet that accompanied the images. So the first form that the project took was portfolio based. Ideally, I would like to, to have been a book, but as I said, I had really limited time beforehand in. So it ended up being a series of images in a portfolio and you would look through this small book in time with the images and it would give this sort of a mixture of factual descriptions of each image and a richer uh, personal view. Um, and now I'm about to just give you a tour of the project itself. When I get to the, so this is the, the same order pacing and pairings as in the latest edit of the project. Um, because as I said, six years have passed between making and publishing, it's like sort of the ideal editing time because you have time to realize which images get on your nerves 
and don't grow on you and which other ones sort of solidify themselves as strong so rather than rushing it was a really easy edit just to go get rid of that one that one and um, to put them in the right order it tries to stick as much as possible to a linear north south journey but with flexibility for aesthetic reasons so the first image opens this is us at Scrabster right in the north coast of Scotland looking across to Thurso this is where the boat comes in from Orkney um, and I think in, in Scrabs too was where I was sort of wistfully wishing I had used colour film because some of the poles and the tarmac were really interesting but overall I'm quite happy that it is black and white. Um, so we move from Scrabs to down the Cassie Meyer here. This is the road that uh, cuts through from Thurzo. It kind of cuts the north corner off. And a lot of Arcadians heading south go this way. They're not interested in Caithness. They're trying to get as far south as they can get. Whereas for me, Caithness being a family home, I wanted to spend a bit more time there kind of ruminating on it. Um, this image is paired with text. So I'll read that out to you now. So Tuesday, 149 miles. All morning the fog sits heavy in the street. I set off from my granny's house in Wick later than intended, and so the triangle I make around this corner of Caithness becomes rushed, a little tense. The road narrows as it crosses peat bogs, the sound of curlews against the pressing fog. In a deserted John O'Groats, a sign by a burger van reads, stop and eat here or we will both starve. I'm supposed to reach Inverness before dark, but I stay in Wick another night. I drive my granny to the supermarket. I do not want to leave. These images are also Caithness. Um, the one on the left is uh, just north of Wick and it's this big subsea pipeline that they manufacture up there. And it reaches as far as you can see both ways in the horizon. It just sort of goes on forever. And uh, they, they make it in sections and sort of push it out to sea on these rails and it's used um, as part of the sort of North Sea oil industry. And on the right, I was just trying to capture the way that the mist um, just fills that corner of Caithness in the summer. It, the har just comes off the sea and you can't see anything and it just sits around for days. So just catching that atmosphere. I'm sure many of you that have driven down the A road, uh, the A9 have uh, experienced it exactly like that. Um, and, oh, the next pictures. So these aren't mine, they're screen grabs off of a uh, Google satellite and Google Street View. And um, one of the things that I did when preparing for the project and sort of recently is just looking for these ghosts of the old roads. Um, you can find them on satellite view, these kind of hairpin bends that have been smoothed out. Um, the one on the left I only just discovered recently, that's kind of north of Helmsdale. And on the right, you can see Berrydale used to be this really tight one that they've now, um, you can see where they've, they've got that sort of yellowy line. That's the new layout. Um, and on the left, that's just south of Leibster. It's a sort of ancient bridge. So just sort of hunting out these versions of the road that my family would have traveled before me. And in this image, this was exactly what I was trying to capture at Dunbeath was the way that um, when my mum and my grandparents would have got, been going up and down the road years before, this new bridge wouldn't have existed and they had to, you know, stick to the contours of the land, winding really slowly. And just as the, the road is bypassed so many of these towns, this kind of captures everything. Um, you've got this new monumental sort of sculptural form coming down from above the old road curving down and this glimpse of the bypassed town below um, and this for me was it was really exciting to be able to stop take control of the vehicle and actually go under these bridges and and kind of have a good look around at angles I'd never seen before and that you wouldn't normally see when traveling and this is of course that hairpin bend at Berry Tail uh, that I was talking about earlier um, this is since they've 
uh, they've sort of smoothed it out a lot more rather than buckling back in straight away. It sort of goes around the edge of the coast past the cemetery. And so this is now sort of historical. And um, a repeat of that there, but on the right is the underside of the Keswick Bridge, which I think was also built in the 80s and uh, considerably shortened the journey you used to have to go in all the way to Bewley. Um, this one is a uh, Caithness again with um, a bit of the Cassie Meyer Road and it was accompanied by writing. So I think this was one of the images on the day that uh, I was thwarted and couldn't make any more images. So Wednesday, 229 miles. It rains for 161 miles. Leaving the coast behind, I discover that steam has fogged my camera and I am stymied. I stop for a coffee in a roadside services cafe which is stained by grease and nicotine. I sip my drink in the car and resign myself to the journey ahead. I drive south without stopping. The sky is grey and the field sludge green and the horizon indistinct. The radio splutters and cracks as the road gains altitude, its message lost between the mountains. I pass Dromochter Summit enclosed in the spray of passing vehicles. The pylons above waver through the street windscreen, arms outstretched. So this is another image that is quite um, indicative of the time period that the, the work was made in. In 2014, we had the first, well, the Scottish independence referendum. Uh, and at that point, I was undecided. And these, you know, yes and no thanks signs sprung up and down the length of the A9. And it was almost like a driving through this cross section of Scotland's mixed feelings. Um, and it really helped me, you know, make up my own mind how I felt as I drove past these clusters of yes, or, you know, as you hit Perthshire, the kind of no thanks signs. Um, and whoever did this bit of graffiti, um, although it was six years ago, seven years ago, is out there updating it. Every time I drive past, it has a fresh coat of paint or new messages on it. So it's something that always catches my eye on the way up and down. They were also uh, building um, or updating the Denny to Bewley power line. So they were constructing these massive new pylons and getting rid of the old ones, which for me was really lucky as it created these really interesting photographic opportunities. Um, and it's just another thing, like as I wrote about the pylons kind of wavering, it's just part of the landscape there for me. And also makes you think about all these, this infrastructure linking the north and the south. So the energy is all kind of produced um, up the north with wind farms, tidal power, and they're bringing it south to power the cities. So it's that kind of sort of dependency that you don't tend to think about. Um, this is another screen, gra screen grab off of Google. Sorry, it's not great, but this is the Slocht, um, well, just south of Slocht Summit, I think, uh, heading south. And when I was little, I was just completely taken by these, um, the falling rock signs and the wire clad slopes. I think I must have been stuck in traffic or something. And I can just remember sitting saying to my mom, why have they done that? Are they, are they going to fall on our car? And it's just that kind of the imagination of that has stuck with me. And you can see on the right, it's not great, but they've actually had to totally blow up a bit of that hillside to fit the railway through. And these are this is an image that I wanted to capture, but unfortunately that's when the, the police came. <laughs> so I couldn't go onto the railway and get it. But I just feel there's such a connection here. Obviously the scale of these images in America that Mark Riddell has captured, these kind of ominous black holes of the railway tunnels and these sort of gouged hillsides. But there's certainly a, a kind of relationship between the two that this almost sums up what my childhood imagination created at these points. And this image I made at that location, it's not quite got the, the rock that I wanted to capture, but it does show the kind of the meeting of the old and the new. So we have the new A9 on the left here. This is the one that you drive now with that lorry on it. And underneath it swoops the old road, which is progressively more and more overgrown with grass the more you walk along it. Um, this one also comes with a piece of writing. So Thursday morning, 339 miles. 
I retrace the road as far north as Inverness. I park in a lay-by one mile north of Sloch Summit, where the roadsides are met by sheer walls of rock, and where, unknown to me, a parked lorry driver informs the police of a lone female walking south among the wire-clad slopes. I follow the old road as it winds below the new one. A police car pulls up and we converse in shouts between streams of traffic. It becomes apparent that they think I have suicide in mind. Reassured by my camera, they continue south. And heading further south, I think these kind of bring back the echoes of those Burnt and Hilla Becker uh, structures, these sort of geometric shapes sitting in a vast empty landscape. I think this one on the right here was because they were trying to keep the power lines off the, off the railway. And this is another one of those pylons that I was lucky. So this is one that I, in that nice stretch near Dalgwini where the, there's a kind of plateau to the west of the road, it was just scattered and I could see them in the distance, these tiny little crumpled pylons. And I knew if I could get up to one and have it filling the, the image like that, it would look really striking. So I went hunting for them and I have a bit of writing here as well. Thursday afternoon. I pick my way through moorland filled with toppled pylons. Grouse burst from the heather, startling me. A man in a wax jacket approaches. Carrying a gun over his shoulder, he asks me what my intentions are. His eyes are pale and biting. He is concerned I might be stealing eggs. Hey, I'll just go back to the other one because I have some more things to say about it. I think the, the feeling of being up in the Cairn Gorms there is quite strange because you are going you know, up into the mountains, but the road almost keeps the same level with them or just under, so they don't appear you know, as dramatic as somewhere like Glencoe. Um, and I'm just delighted that we still had some snow on the hills to give that feeling, that kind of eerie feeling as you pass through those mountains there. Um, and this was a happy find. So this stretch, um, as you drive along it, you would have no idea of you know, the number of culverts and bridges you'd be traveling over, but by taking that time to stop and get out and wander under, I, you know, I'm making these discoveries of this bridge where you can see right through to the mountains underneath. And um, that's the River Trim. And on the right here is just a roadside. I think, again, as a child, these are the kind of woods where I would imagine wolves or something. So I quite like that, that kind of the creepy trees. But I've been hunting for this spot since, and I have a feeling that it's gone um, from when they jeweled that section. So as far as I know, these trees have all been chopped down. And I was looking into the ways that they're, they're trying to, you know, make this jeweling more environmentally friendly. And they are building animal tunnels underneath and planting more sort of considered local vegetation. So I think that's one of those bits sort of north of Dalhwini, south of... Tomatin, but I'm not really sure exactly where that is. Um, and here are just some more roadside findings. This is heading further south now. Um, I wanted to include this one as it brings us back into the car. Almost all, I think all the other images are outside. So this brings us back to that feeling of driving. Um, when I was doing the research into this project, my, my tutor recommended a piece of writing by Justina Hart. Uh, it's almost a, a conversation with another piece of writing by uh, Will Self about motorway driving. So it's not quite motorway driving, but close enough. And she says, driving is free time, freewheeling up down time for the mind or poetry in motion. I think that feeling of when you are driving, you, you can't escape from it. You know, you can't go on your phone, you can't get busy with something. So it because it absorbs that much of your attention, it allows your ideas uh, to kind of float around. And I quite like that repetitive rhythmic nature of it, the fact that your thoughts are allowed to travel in time with the landscape and you can have a sense of putting something behind you or reaching something. Um, and also it just shows the, the busyness of the road as we head south. Uh, another way that Well Self put it was ecstatic boredom, which I quite enjoyed. So this is, this is not only um, a mirror reflection, but that reflection that you have as you travel. And the last image in the series was taken at the 
Blackford. As you know, I think it is the bank foot turn off. I, uh, I always get those two mixed up, but this is, you know, near the Tullabardin um, distillery. So I think I have got that, that caption wrong, unfortunately. But yeah, this was as I, as I was driving that uh, on the original journey um, after I left Perthshire, it was the first time I'd ever driven on dual carriageway and it was getting dark and it was pretty much just a mission for me to get home safely. So this was made on a return visit trying to recreate the experience of my original journey. And what I had been kind of struck by was these avenues of street lights um, piercing or punctuating the darkness. So um, I wanted that to be the final image was this kind of return to the central belt. I'll just find a bit of writing there, I lost my place. So Thursday night, it darkens as I drive south, bruised skies visible between the pines. The road here is jewelled. I weave between lorries, only their lights visible against the mark. Brief avenues of street lights punctuate the darkness. The central belt glows in the distance, a dim band of orange filling the horizon. So that brings us to the end of the image series. Um, and now I'm going to talk a bit about um, how it came about that this was published recently in my journey through that process. So um, I'm very lucky uh, to have built up a relationship with a publisher um, called Another Place Press run by Ian Sargent, who's based in the Scottish Islands. So something I would recommend certainly for anyone sort of starting out or, or who does have their own photographic practices, sharing it on social media. Without that, I don't think any of this would have happened for me. So, um, Ian has been a supportive figure in the industry for a number of years. He runs um, uh, an online magazine also called Another uh, Place, where he, he featured some of my degree work in 2015. Um, and at the time, I remember discovering his Out of the Ordinary series and being fascinated by his own images of Orkney, Caithness and Aberdeen. I was delighted to see the care and attention he gave to these places, which had often felt snubbed or overlooked during my time as a student in Glasgow. Bearing in mind that this was kind of before uh, things like the North Coast 500 or before Instagram kind of exploded tourism on Sky, there wasn't the same draw or appeal to the North as there seems to be at the moment. Um, so, so for me to find this this sort of photographer making beautiful images about the North, I felt a, a connection there. Um, and so after a few years of me sharing images from another project, the one that's on screen now, this is uh, Undertow, which is my project to walk the coastlines of Orkney. Um, he got in touch with me at the end of 2018 to say, would I like to turn the project into a book with him? And of course I said, yes. Um, Ian grew up in the Highlands and he understands the motivation behind my projects. I don't have to explain why the places in my work are important to me as they're often significant to him too. Um, and when we met um, to discuss this work, he also said that he liked the A9 series and felt a connection to it, but that it wouldn't be enough to fill a whole book. But then he came out with um, Field Notes, which I have on screen here. It's just a series of limited edition photozines. Um, and these can be kind of around 20. I think my, my book, I think, has 22 images. So it's like short number, short series, and just these beautiful little booklets or photozines that encapsulate like the feeling of a place or, or the message of your project. And for your information, he accepts a certain number of submissions to these each year. So he doesn't accept submissions for the, the proper, you know, the, the books, but for field notes, if you've got a project that relates to place in some way and you feel it's ready, you know, to go out into the world, I would let Ian know about it because he takes a certain proportion each year and publishes submissions. Um, so when it came to adapting my images, which had previously been for my degree submission to, to this format, um, it was quite good working with Ian. Um, we kept the order that I had originally had pretty similarly and re-slotting in these bits of writing that I had. Um, and the only sort of change was he had initially handed me a layout which was very fluid and very dynamic which you know little images in a corner full page that kind of thing and it, for some reason it just didn't 
fit with with what I envisaged and I realized it it needed that kind of monotony or not monotony but rhythm um, to match the feel of traveling by road so it's almost as if by keeping each image the exact same size page after page it starts to build up the rhythm of experiencing the world through a windscreen um, or through a car window and I tried to make pairings if I did so with a kind of lighter image on one side and a darker image on the other. It had been quite dull and rainy for the course of the journey. And by creating this stark contrast, it kind of livened the images up in a way that if a dull, beside a dull image, they, they just look really soggy, <laughs> a bit too Scottish. So um, I don't know if you can see me if I'm quite small in the corner of your screens, but for example, pairings like, like this or, and in the one that's on your screen there, that kind of echoing form where Berrydale kind of creates this line down and then the Keswick Bridge picks it up in the top right corner. Um, so this brings us to now currently the sort of collaboration between Flow Photo Fest and Sterling Photography Festival. Um, and the fact that the, the A9 links these two places and it's now situated at points along the A9, which I find, um, look ideal considering the work has been sitting unseen for so many years for it to be given this sort of platform now is just amazing and I'm really grateful. So um, this is at the toll booth in Stirling. I had these existing A1 frames from my degree show so they've come back out and we've just supplemented these with others from that are kind of uh, relevant so a collection of images there and here. And then what we've done, because of COVID, we couldn't really have the zine sitting out. Um, you know, multiple hands touching the same object isn't great, but it's actually turned out to be a total silver lining because um, amazingly the gallery have adapted the zine for their digital display. And it's turned out to be an ideal way to share the, uh, the project because each image is on screen for about 30 seconds and you're given this moving, changing, um, impression interspersed with the text and the paired images. So I'm just delighted with how it's looking at Sterling and you can still catch this um, until Saturday. And it's also on show in Hoko and Inverness, um, a selection of eight images, um, which were kindly put up by Matt Sellers. Um, yeah, and just the last page just gives you that overview of the whole project again, the, the roads drawing you onwards, you know, the objects which catch your eye on the sides. Um, and there's my social media as well. If I think it'd be quite good to move on to questions if that works and we can almost have more of a conversation at this point. I'll, um, I've hidden you all, so I'll make you all come back. <laughs> Thank you, Francis, that's great. Yes, it'd be nice to take the opportunity just for people to direct questions to you. Francis, do you want them to pop them in chat and you'll pick them up? Or do you... Yeah, I'm going about... to have a wee, a wee read. If anyone wants to put their hand up and, and speak, I would be happy with that as well. Um, I feel I rushed the beginning a little bit because I was quite nervous. So if this, it might be an idea if there's anything that um, triggers things I was supposed to say, that would be quite good. <laughs> if anyone has any nostalgic connections or memories of the A9, I would quite like to hear them. I'll uh, share one of my experiences. It's not so much a question, but um, I had quite an experience with the A9 uh, back in June. I'd went up to Aviemore for a holiday with my bike and my new car. And uh, on my way home, as I was at, I was just before Dalwini, so there's a place that you pass it's called the Kuith and just as I was passing that my bike carrier snapped and my bike came flying off and smashing into the back windscreen of my car so that's my current uh, memory whenever I think of the oh. A9 if someone says the A9 or I see the signs through <laughs> the ruling the A9 all I can think of it is my my poor little car and it's smashed windscreen. I know, I know when you've when you've had an accident like that it is really hard to shake the feeling of it in fact, those frames uh, that I showed you uh, here, these, uh, the two on the right, they were involved in a car accident. I'd made it the whole way up the A9, 
gone over to Orkney and I was driving along the barriers and a car went into the back of me and totally inverted my boot <laughs> and luckily the frames were just far enough away that they weren't destroyed so they've had a bit of an adventure too. <laughs> that leads on to, I'll ask another question, sorry I'm like taking over, um, okay. is there a particular stretch of the A9 that you have like particularly fond memories of there or like a if someone mentions the A9 to you, is there a particular part that springs to your mind? Well, it was funny when I was putting together those associations, I'll go back to the, the page. They all seem to be kind of from at least the middle to the north end, these, uh, these childhood ones where they are, yeah, the kind of signifiers. And it did seem to be like, as I, when I was little, I probably started picking up my attention the closer we got to my granny's house because it meant that the torture was nearly over and things like um, seeing the sea was really important to me because I, as I said I always had this feeling that I belonged up north or belonged in Orkney or Caithness but that I lived in the borders and so it was really sad when we left the sea each time so that was a big marker and just that stretch I'd say I love I really love the bit um, as you go through Dalgwini where it, it splits and snakes that's really interesting and then pretty much anything north of Inverness as you get to Caithness yeah I think um got yeah. a question there. Uh -huh. a question from Colin or Colin's raised his hand so Janie are you able to mute I think Colin can unmute himself can you Colin I can I hope <laughs> <laughs> Hi Francis, it's very interesting to hear your take on as a child. I grew up next to the A9, so where, where you travelled in your childhood, I was stuck next, <laughs> just north of Dunblane. Um, my parents moved to, so between Dunblane and Ocarada, uh, and you could see the A9 when you looked at the sort of like front of the house. And so there was this kind of idea that it would go in both ways, uh, you know, as, as a sort of without actually ever traveling it you knew that you were sort of stuck next to it mm -hmm. and, and to hear your experience of actually traveling it in, in your childhood you know mine was sort of imagining someone like you doing <laughs> the, the journey back and forth so it's quite interesting but as i've kind of grown up um it's, it's become i suppose everyone calls it scotland's route 66 it's the kind of backbone of scotland it's, it's you know you go on road trips to it uh, you know, and I've got countless sort of football trips and I've climbed hills, which obviously the A9 is a, a kind of major route to hills. So, so now I kind of look at it, you've taken photographs of I look at the hills and think mm -hmm. which ones I've done. Uh, and lastly, my brother moved to Orkney. So finally, now, you know, repeating your journey to um, cross the Pentland Firth and stuff. So love the book, love the idea. And a whole lot of it resonates with me. You know, all the, 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 the points along it now, the um, particularly sloth is one with the, the mm -hmm. German soldier's face. I yeah, I wasn't sure whether to um, mention the soldier's face because I I hadn't been aware of that as a child and I only came across it when starting this project. I don't know if anyone knows to look out for him at well, Sloth. Kids absolutely, kind of, that's one of their waypoints. Is are we nearly there yet? Are we passed yeah. it? Are we coming up to it? Is it kind of thing? <laughs> and again, it's uh, the gas rigs as you come up to... Um, so past Helmsdale, uh, mm -hmm. as you come up the hill there, you see them off in the North Sea, if it's a good day. Uh, and my final thought about A9 is that um, one of my great photography projects was, um, there's a guy in Edinburgh uh, called Sigs who writes his name everywhere. And, and to my absolute joy, he's got his name on a bin at Layby 109, sort of near <laughs> Moy it must be. Uh, and there's another one on a house just south of Helmsdale. So again, ties into the fact that my project, I collect all his work, which is only ever in Edinburgh, apart from Helmsdale and Moy. Uh, and you get a wee travel trip to Helmsdale. <laughs> Mentioning all these, well, I stumbled across the Helmsdale one on the way to Orkney, you know, 60 miles an hour, trying to catch the ferry, and suddenly my son goes, look, Sigs, you're like, what? You know, breaks on you, <laughs> turn kind of thing. So, yeah, it's, you know, I think everyone's got stories about the A9, or, you know, anyone who's lived in Scotland has, and it's great to hear yours, mm -hmm. and I say, it sparks conversations for me with um, other people, just wave the, the book and say, have you seen this? And, and yeah. it's supposed to come out. <laughs> Great. Well, so, yeah. yeah, good work. Love it. Well, thank you. I think that that catching that boat to Orkney has thwarted many an attempt to 
to sort of rehash or add to this project because as I said there's like things I'll find on satellite view or images that I have in my head that I want to add but I'm always about to catch that ferry to Orkney mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to just keep barreling past but another sort of interesting graffiti is springing up all around Inverness are those flat earth bits of graffiti because I think yeah, that's where the headquarters is. So I think if, I don't know if if that had been such a thing in 2014, if I, that would have made it into this project or not. But it is really interesting seeing kind of almost these bits of people's ideas or yeah. you know, the way culture is going sort of strewn along the roadsides. Yeah, well, they used to be all the picked signs everywhere. They're not exclusive to the A9, but they seem to have been a, a, of their time. I don't know if you remember them. There's what was it? The... And then was it there were stickers all sure. over Scotland. I don't know about those. Uh, like, you know, but they, they, they were there for a long time, but they've all gone. So, yeah, it's how it changes and evolves. Again, I, I remember um, the Blackford, Oxford, uh, a brother, and all these places that you used to have to drive through to get up the A9. Now, as you say, your photo of the Blackford bypass, you know, as I remember having to slow down, go through the village, uh, you know, it took forever just to get to Perth. I think from my parents' house now, it's like 20 minutes. It used to be like 40 or 50 minutes. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I think that was a big part of the project, is hearing, hearing my parents kind of describing their <laughs> own personal sufferings of the road and yeah. how when I travel it, it's, it's like this sort of family ritual or almost pilgrimage, like that feeling for now, um, if I'm heading locally, I have this draw, like the road wants to pull me north. And when I do have the opportunity to be thinking, I'm driving right the way through to Caithness, it's like a really good feeling. <laughs> um, I'm just seeing if there's other questions. There's a question from Zeph, just asking um, how you first became interested in photography. In photography? So my course at art school um, was communication design, which is split into three disciplines, which is illustration, graphic design, and photography. There is also a fine art photography course at Glasgow School of Art. And um, when I was applying, it was just the mixture and the richness of the communication design course that drew me. Also, I was deferring having to make that final decision. So I had these three you know, options ahead of me. Um, and it was actually an exchange in Canada uh, at OCAD, which is uh, in Toronto, that, that made my mind up for me because I took illustration and photography there and I absolutely hated my illustration courses and loved my photography courses. So that was what forced the decision. <laughs> and when I came back to Glasgow, um, I, had, I was under uh, my tutors, Andy Stark. So it's quite a small class. So only tends to be between five and like maximum 15 people taking photography. I think my class either had seven or nine. So you get this really close knit bunch um, and really like rich, valuable crits. So you can really get to the bottom of what you're trying to say. And because it incorporates graphic design as well, you're left with the, the skills to adapt your, your work for book purposes. You know, you've got that like layout awareness as well. And it's all about communicating an experience into another form. So that that worked for me. Um, but if you'd asked me before I applied to art school, was I going to be a photographer? I would have said no. And actually, even after graduating, I hesitated to call myself a photographer. It was a word that I struggled with. Um, I'm getting there now. <laughs> and speaking of like your projects that you've done, um, Ian's asking after the A9 and the Orkney, uh, projects. Do you think you'll continue working on linear projects or do you have another idea in mind? I do really seem to respond from having a, like a rule or a central thing to focus on. I've never managed so well, you know, you, like my course and um, people were working on kind of things that could have been called photojournalism to like documentary and I've never felt very comfortable almost parachuting into something that I would consider to be someone else's business, uh, it, it would feel like I was invading. So for me, it's always been about landscapes that are personally significant. And when I was in Canada, obviously those landscapes I didn't know, but I had encountered one big project I made was about the ravines in Toronto, and I had encountered them through uh, literature. So there were, in a lot of Margaret Atwood's writing, she set scenes in the ravines. So that enabled me to, I'd met these places fictionally, and I got to go and be down there in person. And I was sort of seeing 
fictional events that had happened at each location, as well as my own experiences. So I quite like that duality. So that, again, is another linear preset, uh, a geographic thing controlling the project. Then the, in this case, it's a road. And in my Orkney project, it's a coastline. So it all seems to be quite, there has to be sort of solid rules. Um, I might be about to make work that's less, you know, rigid, but I'm almost trepidatious about it because it seems to be something that I've really, I've learned a methodology, it works for me. Um, but the Orkney one is great because that coastline seems to last forever. <laughs> so <laughs> I've got a big, you know, well to draw from there. I've got endless, endless coastline left. Um, yeah, I seem to, I certainly seem to prefer finding something and then just drawing from it endlessly rather than dotting about to new projects. Uh, there's a couple more. I don't know if you want to stop sharing your screen now just so you can sort of yeah, join. Yeah, sure. I think I was, uh, I was maybe going to, if anyone asked about a particular image, I could have got that back up again. I'll just, sure. I don't know if there's any. Um, nah, I'll wait. I, I'll stop sharing. Thanks. <laughs> just makes it easier for yeah, you. Yeah, I can see everyone. The, the questions, and we've still got plenty of time if anyone else has more questions to just uh, drop them into the chat. Uh, and we can go through them all. But I think the next one um, that I seen it was Nirvana. So they missed the start of the session. But do you shoot on film or are you digital? What's your sort of work um, method? Certainly, when I was a student, I didn't own a digital camera. I didn't have even a smartphone. Um, so everything was, and I think that's something that as I, as I reflect on how I work now versus how I made my A9 project, it's quite interesting. So I was almost looking when I prepared this talk for like background images or behind the scenes sort of things and I had nothing. It's as if there's a digital void and everything is film. Um, I have, I make this project and my Orkney project have both been made using medium format black and white film uh, using a Mamiya 645. And what I enjoy about that, as I said, writing is a really important part of my project. Um, it allows me to think about the experience and absorb kind of any sort of emotions or experiences that I have and get them down on paper before I'm confronted with what I have actually managed to capture. I know people say, oh, film slows me down, but genuinely I, I like that space. If I'm out with a digital camera, and I've got something in front of me and I try and take it, I'm like, no, nope, didn't get it. And I take it like endless times and I find that really disruptive. Whereas with film, you've got to just accept, like maybe you got it, maybe you didn't, that's it. And you'll find out later and it's, it almost frees you. Um, but more recently having a, a smartphone or an iPhone that has come into play. So those are almost like, photographic note taking they're insubstantial they don't you know they don't cost money so I can use them as almost in the way that my writing is gathering experiences that's almost gathering them in the form of images and then the film photo is the the real um sort of the image with more presence that can be blown up really large for a gallery setting for example whereas an iphone photo it's almost it's just for me so that's how I work I will use digital for you know documenting stuff or if I'm asked to do a portraiture commission I'll switch to digital just because of the nature of it it's faster and more useful but I work I work with film for my projects um, just I'm just going to scan down and catch the next one after that one um, so continuing to notice things on this is from Debbie Sutherland um, or even in the areas that haven't been altered or modified yes um, and I think doing this project has actually added value so now as I travel the road I get a lot more satisfaction from knowing what's out there and what's under there like I find those tensions between the man-made construction of the road and its connections with the natural world really exciting um, and like that alteration that that satellite view of that here can bend where it continued I only just spotted that the last time I went up the road and I've still not managed to document it I don't know whether there's any value for me in continuing to document it with film because it's almost like a closed 
you know, it's it's finished now. I've, I've published it. I've shown it. It's it's a nice, you know, beginning to end journey. But maybe just for me, I can supplement it with these gatherings. Um, yeah. And then Joe was asking about the use of the car. I don't know if you want to read out the question, Lindsay, for people that can't see them. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. Um, so the use of the car is obviously very important to the project for a number of reasons. Um, would you consider walking stretches of the A9 sort of similar to your work for Undertow? I don't know. Like when I when I was walking it, I, I had a weird response from like by walking I mean parking up and walking to a point that I had spotted that was maybe a mile because when when you start doing this you realize just how far apart the laybys are and how much slower it is as a sort of ant like human trying to get to the place that a minute ago you were zipping past um and I got honked at I got the police phoned on me I met that guy with the gun who was quite chilling like he was quite scary and it makes you realize you're far away from your car, you're alone. And it, I don't know, there's a bunch of weirdos out there. <laughs> so I don't know if I want to walk it. I have seen people walking it and running it. I saw someone on a penny farthing with like a huge backed up lane of traffic behind him. And I just thought that's ridiculous. <laughs> um, I would like to walk the John O'Groats Trail from Inverness to John O'Groats, but that's there'll be stretches of the road that go pretty close to it but that's almost more for me in terms of connecting with my childhood memories and family memories of Caithness which would be I guess alongside but separate from the A9 and I maybe would not want to photograph it it might just be quite nice just to be in that landscape on foot and maybe make work about it afterwards. There's a comment from Anne just saying that she didn't realise the A9 at Stenhouse Muir um, is the end of the old Drover's Road and there's a Highland Cow statue there, uh, which is a memory of that and not the toffee factory that used to be, <laughs> <laughs> used to be there. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting when you start looking into things like General Wade's military roads and all, all that and the kind of uh, um, Latherin, is it Latherin wheel? There's an old, there's an ancient drover's road down there that cover, that's on a, a bridge and you just think of these people walking it for days rather than you know the way we barrel through now it is really interesting seeing these ghosts of the past um, and then Rosie was asking if the booklet is available yes it is um, to coincide with the the two exhibitions um, Ian Sargent um, kindly decided to release a third edition so there's another 100 copies available that are for sale currently I think Lindsay's put the yeah, link. Put the link in it. Yeah, that, so you see um, the link to purchase the photos in is there. Um, and then I'll let you I'll let you be the manager of the questions. <laughs> so I'm really interested in the addition of using writing alongside photography. Um, I was a wee bit disappointed I couldn't read the pink insert in the Undertow book because it it looked so interesting. <laughs> I know. Um, I've had so many emails from. Um, like people saying, please send me a high res version of that. I wanted to read it. I'll just get it so people know what we're talking about. Um, so this is a, a different project. Apologies for the hardcore A9 fans. You're going to have to hear about something else. But <laughs> I, in Orkney, I, I started writing my notes on OS maps. Um, and when I first started, I would just write the odd thing down. And as I'm encountering new islands now, so like the smaller islands in the north that I've not lived in, and the fact that I think I now live in a city, everything has become really um, sort of almost exciting and important and worth writing down. So where I used to write the discovery of like a new beach I didn't know about, I now write the sounds of the birds, what plants I see, um, it's, it's endless what I'll write down. And I wanted to include these in the handout that came with Undertow, but I didn't want the sort of commercialization of what I write to affect what I write in the future, because I think it's it, it's for me, it's my memories. And if I if I started selling these, like people ask me for prints of these, and I think no, I, I can't sell it because um, it will then ruin or impinge on future walks, and I'll be thinking. I can't write that because someone will read it 
or I have to write a certain thing to make it interesting for this outside eye. And so I think when you're making work, you have to, you've got this almost core project that's just for you. And then maybe there's a bit more that the audience are letting to. And then there's like the big jazzy bits you use to advertise, you know what I mean? So there's like these kind of layers of protectiveness. Um, but what I did do um, is I did take some of the writing, James, and it is included. So what you're reading in text is an adaptation from the handwritten maps. Um, and yeah, so this Rousey map is five separate walks and I've taken the core aspects of each walk and turned them into separate kind of almost poems, but they're not poems, they're just, they're lifted from the walks. Um, when I exhibit the work, I do include the handwritten maps. So I feel that's a fair exchange. Like it's almost like a one-on-one, -on -one, one person can read it at a time that they've come to the gallery, they can they can read it, but they'll probably forget it rather than printing and publicizing things that I don't want to be um, turned into a commodity. It's my long answer. <laughs> James also asks, um, let's see, uh, can you see it bigger elsewhere? Where did the idea of writing, using writing come from? And then Janie's sort of added on to that question, just saying she loves uh, your writing and sketches and notes. How important are these elements to your work? Do you have a formula or, or, or are all the other media, like, is it all developed organically as you're going along? So the writing started, um, so uh, as I said, I went on exchange to Canada and I made that kind of project about the ravines in Toronto. And um, I knew that the first project I would have coming back when I got to Scotland was to make a book. Um, and I had, so I'd come back to Scotland, I had my images, I couldn't make any more. So I was really stuck with just pacing and editing them and creating a flow that would recreate an experience that I had had. And when you take pictures as you move through like a day or a landscape, you'll find it, it solidifies your memories. So it makes, insignificant or forgotten the things that you didn't take and the things that you did take are in the forefront but actually that might tip the balance of what you want to show or what you want to create from it and I was sat with my images and I almost couldn't see them or get any feeling from them anymore because I had sat with them too much and I returned to a letter I had written my friend so we had been sending each other postcards and letters constantly when I was in Canada and I said oh Rachel can I have that letter back and it was so fresh hearing about my first experience of trying to get into the ravine. So I had to like run across a dual carriageway. I was alone in this kind of big wilderness. It was quite scary, which was in the middle of a city. So it wasn't true wilderness. It was kind of impinged upon by like less desirable activities. So my, my writing kind of captured my fear, my interest, the, the experience of like clambering in there. And so I thought, I need to keep doing this in future. And it continued with the A9 project. I got those memories down. And um, as I showed you with the, the writing, I find it a lot easier on a paper, on a bit of paper, and to be quite loose and free with it. And it only becomes more solidified later. Um, and with the Orkney maps, it's the same where I have had to remove that pressure. If I thought I was writing for an audience and not just myself, I wouldn't be able to put anything down at all. It's it's removing that outside eye. So it starts off just for me, unpressured, and then if something wants to grow from it, I'll I'll turn it into something else. Brilliant. Um, James also asks, uh, did you make any sketches of the A9 similar to views from the plane? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, I think on my on my uh, sort of reckies as I described them up and down, you know, to my granddad's funeral when I was trying to spy things and plot it out, I would draw like a lay by or like a scrabbly pylon, like remember to get the pylon. <laughs> but I, I don't really draw, um, no. And it's maybe something that I would be interested in, but I, I almost find I like that the camera the way it focuses on those kind of structures and objects that I find I th that gives me more than a, than I would need from a drawing. 
Yeah, I'm just seeing what Ian said about In the Skin of a Lion. That was um, in, I, I read that. Um, and there's another one by him. Uh, yeah, no, In the Skin of a Lion. Sorry, I was getting mixed up with the English patient, but it's where a nun falls from the bridge that covers the ravine and someone saves her, but she runs away and changes her identity. So everyone thinks she's died. I'm not really spoiling it because I think this happens right at the start. <laughs> um, everyone thinks she's died, but she actually starts a new life. So a lot of what I spoke about with the ravines was that they were a place for um, sort of upheavals of identity. You can go into them, fight your battles and emerge a different person. And it's the same in Cat's Eye by Margaret Atwood. It's like a location for childhood bullying and her bullies kind of push her into the ravine and she nearly dies, but it's this kind of internal battle. So it's a really frustrating project because I kind of did all this research into the literature of it, that the photos don't back up. So I would love, I would love to go back now and create a kind of dialogue between the real ravine and the layered fictional ravine. But I don't know if, you know, traveling to Toronto to do that would just satisfy my own need or if it would be valuable how can you show fiction in a photograph so I find that quite tricky um, but yeah it's a nice idea <laughs> that's what I wrote my uh, my dissertation about um, is that is that Ian yeah Ian if you ever want to read that just send me an email it's <laughs> it goes into it in a bit more detail I don't know Concrete Island but I'll I'll keep a note of that something to read. Um, how many images were edited down to make the 22? There were more, but they were just, they were just not great. So I think in my, in my initial project for um, art school, I was trying to bulk it up to make it a weightier project. But what I think I've learned since then is actually um, like, kill your darlings. If anything says anything twice, get rid of it. It's so much cleaner to just have one image doing it properly once rather than two similar images that, because then they just detract from each other rather than just saying it cleanly. Um, and it was really quite satisfying to get rid of them. And then Ian got back to me and he was like, oh, can we not put that one? And I said, nope, <laughs> it annoys me too much. Um, and like I had issues with camera shake because it was quite dull. So there were there were images I never got that I would like to have get um, managed, like for example at Dramocter Summit, um, I think maybe just north of there. There's a bit where there's almost a, a pass looking west where this ancient road kind of curves in. And I'd love to have had that one, but I had camera shake in it, so it was a mixture of culling for technical kind of perfection and also repetition. And there were too many from Caithness. And actually, um, uh, Janie, when we had to lay out that map for, for Tara at the toll booth, so we were thinking a lot of people might not know the extent of the A9, they might not have any sort of geographic relevance right to the north of Scotland. And we laid out where each picture was taken. And there is a big gap between um, kind of sort of Golspie area to Inverness where um, that was my camera was fogged. <laughs> I didn't get anything. So maybe that's the gap I need to patch in the project, but no offense if anyone lives there. I do find that stretch when you've gone over the, uh, is it the Cromarty Bridge and past kind of uh, Neg and all that. Like, I don't think there's anything particularly photographic that I want to get from there. I think I've ticked those boxes with my other images. Maybe, maybe the, Cromarty Bridge, one of those bridges that would be a good shot to get, because I think maybe that is something that's missing. We do get to see the Keswick Bridge, but there's a whole bunch of bridges there that I've not, I've not shown. Um, and maybe that, yeah, that image of the Keswick Bridge, it doesn't quite show, you know, the scale of a bridge spanning something. So that's maybe one aspect that I am missing. Um, I'm just reading about coming down. Yeah, Janie, because um, we were chatting about where it started and kind of the more significance of the Stirling end. And I'm wondering if because as a child, I cut off that section that like we headed up from the borders through Edinburgh and kind of maybe got there at that Perth roundabout. And then later as an adult, I maybe had less 
emotional significance as I would be coming from the Glasgow I'm almost bypassing that true beginning so it is something if I ever feel the need to make this a true start to end um, it might be something that I follow up and maybe actually as they're they've changed Berrydale they're dueling great big stretches of it it might be that the road changes enough that my A9 becomes the old A9 and I want to continue gathering that Oh, and Janie says, is there no, pe no people? Um, no, there is one right at the start. Um, we've got our, our Strabster guy. <laughs> but um, I think he just happened to be in there. And I was quite happy um, to have caught him just out for a morning walk. But it, it is... It is quite a solitary journey. I don't know, this was the first time I ever traveled it alone. I'd always either been in a parent's car or had a parent with me while I was driving or on a bus. So I think I was almost fully embracing that loneliness and just that time. But I tend not to include people in my images um, unless I'm actively working on a sort of portraiture project. Um, it's maybe, it's more about my inner world and the landscape in, in front of me. Any final reflections or observations from you, Francis, about this piece of work and maybe how it connects to other work that you're doing and other projects? Well, I think certainly it's, um, I think the deeper core of, of my Orkney project is it sort of, because I've had this sort of split or binary in my childhood where I was separated from my home, it's about kind of finding or making my home and almost justify myself like, yes, this is mine. I, like I am from here. Um, and I think that that hooks back into the A9 project in the, while I was living in the borders, I had no family connection or roots there. I was almost uprooted and it was kind of saying, this is right, like the North is right. That's where I'm supposed to be. I have it. Um, it's my own, you know, personal boat hole that I can go to. And I think the Orkney project is, it's about um, kind of taking ownership of that place where I sometimes, because I did move back when I was nine, I don't have the accent. My parents didn't grow up there. I do sometimes feel a bit like, a, like a half incomer, half not. And it's about making it my home and building that connection and almost earning it. So by walking the coastlines, I'm, I'm creating that feeling of belonging and recognition. So when I see that landscape again, it's like, I know it, I've been there. I've touched every inch of it. Um, and I think similarly, the A9 is a bit like that. It's like saying, look, Caithness is important. <laughs> it's not the back of beyond. It's not the middle of nowhere. It's, you know, it's a home. Uh, so yeah, I guess it's always about about finding, seeking, or learning about the sense of belonging. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I think that's what I maybe skipped over at the beginning a little bit. So I'm quite glad to have returned to that point. Thank you. <laughs> that's great. And maybe that is an, you know, a nice point in which to end then, unless there's any final questions from anyone. Um, I would just point you towards um, the Flow Photo Fest uh, in, in Verness, where Frances is going to be exhibiting her undertow project during September. Um, and that came as a result of you winning the open competition um, with them in 2021. Um, and so that work is now going to be on uh, exhibition at the Inver Inverness Museum and Art Gallery. Is that right, Frances? Uh, yes, yes. So if um, James is nearby, I'm thinking there's going to be handwritten maps on show so you can get your magnifying glass out <laughs> go and read those <laughs> yeah. um, and it'll be a mixture of old work and new work kind of in conversation following the halt of the project due to the pandemic lockdowns so I was in Glasgow kind of yearning again for the north as I always seem to be <laughs> I picked something up from, I think it was from the Flowfest uh, website uh, in describing your piece and it says the Undertow series is an evolving body of work which explores the changing relationship between an islander and her home. And I just thought that was beautiful. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> so thank you very much for tonight, uh, Francis. That's been 
wonderful. We did have a few tech challenges at the beginning of the evening with some people not being able to get in and then I crashed out. So and my apologies if you got a bit of a wobble at that point, it might have been a bit of a distraction. So my apologies for that. But this has all been recorded tonight and we will um, edit it and upload it to YouTube where uh, you'll be able to access it again and we can share it with anyone who wasn't able to access tonight. Um, so thank you again. And if I can just point everyone to um, the, the remainder of our programme, um, we have actually just talking about writing and photography this coming weekend on Saturday, the Stirling Macker, Laura Fife, is running a workshop um, at the Stirling University campus, which is mindful writing and photography. So there's something there perhaps for those of you who want to consider how you sort of join the written word with, with, with your photographs. Um, and we also have uh, Grace Turner, a dancer, doing an interpretive dance trail there. So more inspiration too, if you're looking for things to inspire your work. Um, and the curators of the University Art Collection will be doing a sculpture trail accompanied by someone from the Conservation Volunteers talking about the uh, flora and fauna on campus. So for those who are looking for sort of lots of inspiration, um, uh, to, to, to develop their own work um, and perhaps reflect back on the importance of the written word and the photograph, then there's lots going on on campus this Saturday. Lots of thank yous crashing in on, uh, on the uh, chat line, uh, Francis. And I just say to anyone who wants to keep a copy of the chat, it's full of references and things. If you hover your mouse over the little three dots in the bottom chat box, uh, you should get a little pop-up menu that allows you to save chat. So in clicking that, it will drop into a Zoom file on your um, desktop, so you know where to find it. Um, thanks again, Francis, absolutely fabulous, and um, delighted that you've spoken with us tonight and, you, uh, and you've got your exhibition with us in Stirling. So thank you very much indeed. Thanks oh, thank everyone. You. Big round of applause for Francis. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you everyone, good night. Mm -hmm.